You're listening to the Cyberwire Network, powered by N2K. Hello, everyone, and welcome to N2K Cyberwire's Hacking Humans podcast, where each week we look behind the social engineering scams, the phishing schemes, and criminal exploits that are making headlines and taking a heavy toll on organizations around the world. I'm Dave Bittner, and joining me is Joe Kerrigan from the Johns Hopkins University Information Security Institute. Hey, Joe. Hi, Dave. we got some good stories to share this week, and we are joined once again by our N2K colleague and host of the T-Minus Daily Space podcast, Maria Vermasis. Maria. Hi, good to be back. <laughs> Great to have you back. And we will all be back right after this message from our show sponsor. But first, a word from our sponsors at Know Before. Time travel would be a particularly powerful tool in the hands of any overworked InfoSec professional. Think about it. Being able to see the future and know which malicious emails would be missed by all the existing filters. Your ability to stay one step ahead of the bad actors would rise to a whole new level. Unfortunately, our sponsors haven't cracked time travel just yet. They are, however, introducing a new phishing protection product that can block and remove dangerous phishing emails before your users even see them. Stay with us, and in a few minutes, you'll learn how. All right, Joe, uh, before we jump into our stories here, and Maria as well, uh, we've got some feedback. Joe, you want to kick things off for us here? Yeah, Alan wrote in with some feedback about episode 278, specifically about Maria's story about Charlotte Cowles. Still not sure if I'm saying that right. And how she was scammed out of uh, $50,000 by putting it into a shoebox as someone pulled up in front of her house with a, in an SUV to take or a Suburban right. to, to drive off with it. Dave, you want to read this one? Sure. Uh, It says, Hi, Dave and Joe. Thank you both and Maria for your recent coverage of the $50,000 in a shoebox scam in the Scamming the Innocent episode. My sister-in-law was nearly victim to something that sounded similar. Because she came to me very early on, I never quite figured out what the scam was and where it was headed. The scam started in a similar fashion. We live in Australia. My sister-in-law was contacted either by instant message or phone in early December 2023. They started off with the same technique of building authority and trust. This time around, the scammers posed as members of the Chinese police investigating a money laundering operation to which they claimed my sister-in-law was suspected to be involved. And uh, he writes, uh, I should add here, if it's not already obvious, that they have absolutely zero jurisdiction down here and any Chinese investigations on our soil would have to go through an MOU with the local authorities being the Australian Federal Police. I like how uh, Australians say down here. (laughs) Because that's what we say is down there. Down there. (laughs) Down under. Down under, that's true. Uh, Anyhow, they used the same spoofing trick to establish their authority. They asked her to Google a police station in Shanghai and to look at the phone number. Then Mm. they proceeded to call her from this number and convinced her that they were the Chinese police. They convinced her to take part in a video call via Skype. They were even wearing police uniforms during the Skype video call to further cement their credibility and authority. I'm I'm picturing um, you know those like uh, haphazardly pasted on sort of like Instagram filter things that... <laughs> for a Halloween costume. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's right. what I'm picturing is the Halloween costume. <laughs> they went they went to the uh, to the the Halloween costume place and and got you know that pop up thing and they just right. got like fake badges and right. stuff. Turns out they're dressed as like U.S. Forest Service officers right. or something. <laughs> right. yeah, it's just, uh, now this is this is where she revealed to them details of her driver's license and passport. There was the usual don't tell anyone threats, and they said they would call her every few hours to check in and make sure she was okay. Mm. At this point, there was nothing about any money. My sister-in-law called me about a day later because she felt something was off and asked for advice. I work in the field of computer forensics in the public sector. I'm glad she went with her gut and decided to reach out as it could have ended quite badly. Yeah, Mm -hmm. oh yeah. Because they hadn't gotten to the money part, I wasn't clued in as to how the scam was going to unfold. I thought it could have been an attempt at identity theft, but this was a lot of effort to go into to get the credentials of one person's identity. We played it safe, and she went and got replacements for her license and passport, as well as registering herself with a local nonprofit support organization set up to assist those with identity theft concerns. 
Well, like, everywhere else in the world has good things but us. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Glad you said it. I was thinking it too. Like, that sounds got, like a great service. Why don't we hey, have that? I want to talk, we're going to talk about that, this website afterwards because okay. there are good resources on it. Okay. I also advised her to ignore all further comms from the scammers and explain to her how easy it was to spoof the number that pops up on the phone. I really wish telcos would just fix this already. Amen to that. Oh my gosh. It wasn't until I listened to the Scamming the Innocent episode of your podcast where you spoke about the scam from start to finish that helped me learn as to how this particular scam was going to play out, so thank you for that. Nice. There are times when I think about being a target for one of these scams, but instead of handing over a sealed box of cash, I'd fill it with something juvenile, <laughs> like weak old chicken bones or something. Did someone say glitter bomb? <laughs> <laughs> So thank you, Alan, for sending that in. Uh, first off, the website that Alan mentions is ID Care, and it's very Australia and New Zealand centric. Mm. So, um, but it does have a what is it? Resources site. Uh, it's a it's a got some videos on there mm. that walk you through these scams. Oh, uh, and those are not particularly uh, New Zealand and Australian centric. They're okay. universal. They have some. Um, some cheat sheets or, you know, like flyers. Those are pretty much specific to the area. Uh, but the videos are definitely worth checking out. So you can send any family members to this. Uh, I also want to say this. Uh, I also have the same juvenile urges here. No. <laughs> like, <yeah>. Have you? <laughs> but, but the thing is, I want everybody to remember, uh, with the, the scam with Charlotte, the, the bad guys knew where she lived and they showed up at her house. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, with an SUV that probably had more than one person in it. Mm -hmm. uh, these are not somebody you want to mess with. These are not, these, these people are criminals. They're coming after $50,000 that they want really badly. Uh, the best thing to happen is is what you did here, and it's just hang up the phone and don't don't acknowledge them anymore. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, we got some more follow up uh, yeah, here on the same thing. story. We yeah. have uh, Clinton writing it. in. He says all three of the hosts missed the most important detail of the story that could have stopped it in its tracks. Well, thanks for writing in, Clinton. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Clinton, Clinton raises an important point. Yeah. <laughs> he says the entire scenario began when they called her and the verification was accomplished when they called her at any point in time the journalist in question hadn't said ins had insisted on hanging up the phone and verifying the number on her own uh, and initiating a call herself the scenario would have failed hmm. uh, therefore as I see it the most important takeaway is never accept anything told to you by anyone unless and until you initiate a phone call and that beyond, uh, you know, beyond a doubt that you're talking to the person or entity you believe you're talking to. Mm -hmm. uh, any or all other cases, you should believe this is a scam, period. A mm. uh, couple of things about this. And number one, that's right. That's a best practice. I'm going to say that. Uh, but we had a story a couple of weeks ago about a guy who was working with, I think it was Capital One Bank. Yeah. And he called the Capital One and uh, and tried to tell them what was going on, and they had no idea what was going on, and then the scammers called him back. Yep. So he had done something like that and still got mixed mixed up in this and wrapped around the axle. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, it's, it is the absolute best way to think about things is if someone calls you, just don't trust it. But, I mean, real life is messier than that, and I feel like yeah. it's we're sort of setting people up for failure if we're like, never trust any inbound phone call because your phone is just an attack vector at this point, so just ignore anything that comes in. <laughs> right. I mean, okay, that is the ideal if you can operate that way, but I think uh, that is a, a very difficult way for a lot of people to live. Um, and again, it wasn't like this was one phone call and she was done. This was hours and hours and hours of them working for her, working at her. Uh, right. And I mean, I've received phone calls where people that were legit, where they were asking me to verify PII for things like pharmaceutical calls, that kind of thing. And I'm going, right. this, mm. is, this is a really bad practice, but this is pretty standard for the healthcare industry. Yeah, uh, I mean, what, where do we draw the line with never trust any inbound phone call? I mean, plus they had her PII. So I don't know, they weren't right. asking her for stuff. They already had it. Yeah, it's it's and again, we're sitting here with the uh yeah, I don't want to say the what Clinton said is not correct because it is correct. That is a best practice to yep. hang up the call and say, I'll call you right back. Uh and he's right. If that if if uh if Charlotte had done that, this probably would have stopped right in his tracks. It's really hard to do that. I mean, it's just especially right. if they have all your information and it's like they're not asking her for it. They already have it. And they're saying, We're mm -hmm. just checking that this is correct. 
that for a lot of people would go, oh, all right, well, the, you know, they don't want anything from me because they already have everything they need. Right, right. Uh, it short circuits your skepticism. Exactly, yeah. and that's where I was going, is that your, your skepticism gets short-circuited because they've actually fired off the fight-or-flight response, and you do not think clearly, and you do not consider other options. Uh, you know, this is the, the old case I always like to point out of the bear, right? When I, I, I tell the story in a lot of talks where I saw the bear on the bike ride, and I don't remember a lot about that portion of the bike ride. Uh, I remember the bear. <laughs> and that's all I remember. Okay. And that's the exact same physiological response. We're all laughing because it's hilarious because I had, yeah. had the crap scared out of me by a bear. But right. th- that is exactly the same thing that they're that they're that they're making uh, making that they're exploiting here. And yeah. that is why Joe is no longer welcome at the uh, Yogi Bear ride <laughs> at Peace Dominion. <laughs> <Right. laughs> Uh, I will add here just a little side note, and I'm, I'm pretty sure I've talked about it here before, that one time I had a credit card issue, and I pulled my credit card out of my wallet, and I turned it over, and I dialed the 800 number on the back of the card, and I was halfway down a phone tree before I realized it was a scammer who was on the phone with me uh, because I had misdialed the number. Mm. And... Mm. So the scammers knew what the bank's number was, and I guess they had just bought up every fat-fingered close number, you know, Off every by fat, one, yeah or, yeah, or flipping a couple of numbers or whatever, and and it's uh, to it, it sounded like I was at the bank, and uh, something tipped me off, and I hung up and called back and. And that time I, I was much more careful when right. I dialed the right number. So, yeah. you know, I think, Maria, your point is great that, yes, there are best practices, but at the same time, I always, you know, joke and say, meanwhile, here in the real world, right. uh, it's much more complicated than that. Yeah, it yeah. is. Yeah. It is. I like your, I like your explanation, Maria, that it gets, real life is much more messy than that. Yeah, right. I mean, yeah, I, great I could go on and on about it forever, honestly, but I just think of all the phone calls I get during the day. 70% of them are spam that I ignore, but the other 30% are from people I don't know that are calling me for legitimate reasons. And am I supposed mm-hmm. to not trust any of that? I mean, maybe. One could argue maybe. <laughs> Never trust any <laughs> phone call. Um, yeah. But, you know, I it's just, especially if you've got, like, a lot of family around or something, you're going to get random phone calls, and you don't really know what it's going to be about all the time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right, well, let's jump into our stories here, and uh, I guess I'll kick things off for us. Uh my story this week comes from Brian Krebs over at Krebs on Security, which is a very well-known uh, uh, security journalist, I suppose, is the best way to describe Brian. Uh, and he was writing about some malicious hackers who are uh, targeting people in uh, the cryptocurrency space, and they're using the online calendar scheduling app Calendly. Oh, my gosh. Now, <laughs> Yeah, so Maria and I are having a shared moment of terror because we both use Calendly yeah. for. Oh. <laughs> is this the one where somebody says, "Hey, make an appointment on my Calendly, and I'll get yeah. back to I you"? I live exactly. on Calendly. That's that's how I do most of all my job. I don't know. I yeah. find it off-putting when someone sends me that and you know tells me to get on their calendar. And uh, well, I'll tell you, in a professional uh, environment, it is a huge time saver and lifestyle upgrade. Because what it does is it lets me, for example, to just put little chunks of time throughout my week when I will be available to do things like interviews for the CyberWire or Hacking Humans. Right. And then if someone wants to do that, one of our producers can send them the link to that Calendly, and then they can choose when they want to sign up for a slot. So what it avoids is all the, what about Tuesday? Okay, well, no, I can't do Tuesday. Can you right. do Wednesday? Well, how about 2 o'clock? No, 4 o'clock. And so, I it, agree. It's an elegant solution. Yeah, all of that back and forth goes away. I agree it's a little weird, I think, in a personal situation. Right. Like, you know, hey, would you like to go out for a date? Sure, here's my calendar. Here's my calendar. You know? <laughs> maybe, maybe that's the problem with it I have, is I just take it too personally. <laughs> yeah. Can you imagine? I should appreciate the improvement in process. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> So uh, this story uh, follows uh, someone who got scammed. And so because of that, uh, Brian Krebs is not using their real name. And so he's referring to this person as Doug. Um, And uh, Doug uh, was reached out to by someone on a, uh, someone on Telegram. uh, And he would, Doug was uh, active in the cryptocurrency world. Mm. um, And... He got reached out to by someone who's claiming to be someone named Ian Lee, 
from an organization called Signum Capital. And evidently, if you're in the crypto world, both of those names mean something. And to me, they do not, but it is a well-known real person and place uh, that has a reputation that is good in the cryptocurrency world. Ah, okay. So, um, this person reached out and said, hey, I, un- I understand you're, uh, in- you have a startup. Uh, I like to fund things. We should talk. Uh, and they engaged via Calendly. Now, one of the things that Calendly allows you to do, and <laughs> before we were uh, doing this show earlier today, I was poking around on my Calendly to just figure out, like, does it do that? Yeah, it does that. Um, it allows you to include an extra link uh, with the event. So, for example, Joe, like if you wanted to book an interview on the CyberWire, you could do so. And once it sent you the invite, that invite could also include a link, mm-hmm. but the link would be through Calendly. So it looks ah, legit. Ah, so it's like it's like having a little bit.ly right in there with it. Yeah. Oh. But you're going to trust it because... It says Calendly. It says Calendly, and you've already done business through Calendly to make the, all of this happen. Yeah. Oh, that's So you're going to trust it. Okay. Right? Hmm. So that's how things got started. Um, then ultimately, uh, when it was time for the two of them to have essentially a Zoom meeting, um, this person, Doug, uh, clicked on the link. Uh, but instead of opening up a video conferencing app, uh, a message popped up on his Macintosh saying that uh, the video service was experiencing technical difficulties. But no problem. Uh, we're the, 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 it said, we're working on a solution. Please click here as a temporary solution. Hmm. So what happened then was it downloaded a script to his Mac, which ran the script, which is just a, I believe it was just a, a um, Apple script script, which like is sort of... Bash script? Yeah, it's Apple's version of that. It's a, it's a scripting language that comes, it's part of Mac OS that uh, lets things, it gives, allows you to just run, yeah, run the scripts automator, on your right? Mac. It's exactly. Right. Yeah. Thank you, Maria. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's like an automator, um, and so that uh, downloaded and executed a malicious trojan. Um, and at this point, uh, Doug figured out what was going on, uh, and he went into panic mode <laughs> in a good oh, way. Yeah, uh, backed up all of his documents, changed his passwords, and reinstalled the OS on his computer. Um, Brian Krebs points out uh, this is a perfectly sane response but it means we don't have the actual malware that was pushed to his Mac by the script because he basically wiped his Mac clean Right. Uh, some other security researchers seem to have an idea of what was going on here what the, the, the different um, types of uh, malware that was installed evidently this is some group who goes by the name Blue Noroff um, which Kaspersky Labs says uh, is part of the Lazarus Group, which ah, is a very that, well makes, that that all adds up actually. Mm. Yeah, yeah. The big crypto guys, the Lazarus Group. Yeah. So um, it's an interesting little pathway, and uh, the Calendly link was not one that I'd heard of before. So it, I guess the bottom line here it's just another example of um, be careful that just because a link comes from a platform that you trust. That doesn't mean that the link is trustworthy. Yeah. It's, it's, these things are just little link translators or link obfuscators, uh, just like all the other ones. Like Twitter puts their own link shorteners, like a link shortener service. Yeah. Um, is that, that's the actual name of it. Uh, so it's uh, a link shortener service built into the app. Yeah. And, and taking advantage of legitimate functionality. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Maria, any thoughts on this one? <laughs> Nothing really to add. No, not for me. <laughs> <laughs> You're looking for another calendar uh, scheduling. I'm app a little. Now, right? I'm a little. <laughs> I'm yeah. I'm a little nervous now because uh, I mean, Calendly is. I'm literally looking at my Calendly account right now. Right. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> Well, yeah. that's great. Trust no one. Don't take any incoming calls. <laughs> don't take any calendar links. Don't click any links. <laughs> God. <laughs> just get off the internet. Uh, soon it's going to be pens and paper all over. <laughs> I'm going to go out and buy some land and just farm. There it really does make you want to just live in a cabin in the woods. It really yeah, does. Yeah, it does. <sighs> Maria, what's your story this week? <laughs> all right. So uh, speaking of don't trust a phone call. So my story is not so much about a scam about as it is about a possible solution to a scam. And I'm 
hmm, I'm question marking all of the things that I'm saying because I'm not really sure <laughs> that it is a solution, but it is someone trying a thing. Uh, okay. And this, this actually uses AI as a possible clunky solution to one of the oldest scams in the book, especially in Japan and increasingly elsewhere, where uh, scammers will call up an elderly person and convince them to make a cash transfer using an ATM. And I put mm. a little LinkedIn, uh, sorry, not a LinkedIn. Wow, where does my brain's at? I put a little YouTube link in our, in our script here. You can see there's a video. And the first seven seconds are what will display on an ATM in Japan if a person walks up to the ATM while holding a cell phone. And I don't know if you've, hmm. yeah. <laughs> it's very attention grabbing. So, so the security camera on the ATM is, is using, I guess, AI yes, it to is. know if you have a phone to your ear. Yep. And if you do, then it plays this video. Yes, and the video translates to warning. That phone call is a fraud. Hang up right now. And it's very like alarms and red and blinky and meant to get, get your attention. And uh, this is actually being rolled out by Japan's National Police Agency. And they're working with Japan's post office bank, which is um, a lot of the, Japan's post office actually has a bank. Uh, so a lot of people get their cash through the post office in Japan, especially elderly people. Um, mm. So this is AI trying to come to the <laughs> rescue and helping people who are commonly being scammed out of their money. And in this case, they're actually enabling some celebrity help with this guy. I actually happen to know who he is. His name is Keita Tachibana. And he's a former basically boy band member who has since retired, uh. but he's now working with Japan's national police trying to help them clamp down on all these scams that are targeting the elderly there. And Oh, good. Yeah, which is nice. I was like, I don't know if this will actually help because as far as I can tell from the video, literally anyone walking up to the ATM with a phone to their ear is going to get this message of any age. I don't know if it really matters. Uh, but right. I imagine that might get really annoying really quickly if you're just having a regular phone call. <laughs> like, like you're on the phone with your 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 significant other. And <laughs> right. your that your phone dog call walker. is a scam. Hang up right <laughs> now. Hang up the phone right now. Yeah. It's, like, it's like I I admire the attempt. <laughs> Why do you keep hanging up on me? <laughs> <laughs> Why are you calling me a scam? Uh, what I was I, I was when I was looking I saw this story because this just rolled out a few days ago. I was trying to figure out what a little bit of the backstory here for these scams in Japan because again this is not just Japan seeing elderly people being targeted, certainly as our world gets grayer and a lot of our, our national populations get older. This, this is happening to a lot of people. I um, feel attacked. <laughs> I'm trying to be tactful. Listen, I'm not as young as I used to be. Either. Uh, the, the backstory for a lot of these scams happening in Japan specifically is that these bank accounts that are being used for fraud, for the cash transfers, are actually being sold on the black market by foreign citizens living in Japan who are often coerced or sort of forced by unfortunate circumstances to sell their bank accounts in the black market. So mm -hmm. a lot of times these are people in real distress um, who uh, maybe have no, no money because they've lost their job. Often the pandemic saw a huge high, uh, increase yeah. from this. Uh, many of them apparently are, according to a report from NHK Japan, they're citizens of Vietnam. So there are people who are often trying to raise money to go back home or send home, and they're selling their, they're being solicited to sell their bank accounts online by crooks, basically. And they're not sure hmm. what that's for. And then if they leave the country and then try to return to Japan, they, that, that person is being arrested for fraud. Right. Uh, so it's like, oh. it's, it's, it's making a bad situation a lot worse. Um, yeah, so, it's the thing about organized crime is it's usually victims all the way down. Oh, sure hmm. is. Yeah, and what was in, another little interesting wrinkle to this story is, I don't know if you heard about this last year, but the, uh, the J Japan's National Police Agency actually floated an idea of closing off all ATM access to any Japanese citizen over the age of 65 to try and prevent this kind of ATM cash scam from happening, which hmm. people were like, that's not going to happen. That's really a bad <laughs> idea. Uh, right. But that's, that's how bad this problem has become, uh, where people are just sending loads and loads of money to scammers. Um, so the, they were thinking like, well, maybe we just close off the ATMs instead of trying to stop this problem. So, wow. Yeah. So this this video at an ATM at at national ATMs across Japan is gonna, is rolling out right now apparently and I'm just it's an interesting idea to try and stem this problem but I wonder if people are just going to ignore it. <laughs> sort of yeah. As an annoyance. I watched I watched this video first and I had absolutely no idea what was going on because I don't speak any Japanese. <laughs> <laughs> That's um, fair. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It reminds me of the like the training that in-store cashiers are getting when it comes to gift cards. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, how if you walk up to the counter at your local drugstore with a dozen Apple gift cards, uh, the cashiers now are trained to say, to ask you questions, to make sure, or to try to help, 
that you're not being scammed. But I suppose, you know, in the same way that if you're under the scammer's spell, who's on the other end of the phone, in Japan, I can imagine the scammer saying, now listen, as you walk up to the ATM, they're going to show you this video and that's just there to trick you. You know, yeah. don't fall for it. That right. sort of thing or whatever. They'll come up with some, some explanation workaround. for right. it. Yeah. Yeah, there yeah. Yeah, there often but, is. Yeah. Yeah, and what's interesting yeah. is to me uh, and, uh, this something I was thinking about in the previous story also, uh sorry, not the previous story. The the listener response about the Chinese police agency scam mm-hmm. person, if they're speaking Chinese to a person in a country where Chinese is not the main language, that can build trust. You're going, oh, well, this person's speaking my native language, and that's not normally what happens here. In Japan, if you hear someone speaking fluent Japanese, you might go, well, this person's clearly not like a foreign scammer trying to get money out of me, so I'm going to trust right. this person inherently. Yeah. Yep. Mm, interesting. Well, I mean, I wish them well. I hope it works. Like you said, Marie, I think uh, I could imagine this just becoming background noise very quickly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If you see it over and over again— you just ignore it. You know, it's like those, have you ever been to one of those gas stations that plays ads while you're pumping your gas? Ah, I have the solution Makes to that. You want to set That's the why place I have an fire. electric vehicle, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> Not the reason, but it certainly helps. <laughs> yeah. Can I, can I tell you what you do there, Dave? Please, oh, yes. Joe. So on, the, on either side of the screen, there's usually a row of, or a column of four buttons on both sides. Yeah. Second button down on the right is mute. Yeah. There you go. News you can use. <laughs> yeah, they in in Japan's case, they've th- this is a huge problem with the elderly getting scammed out of cash. Um, so I I know they're they're trying everything they can to try and stem the tide of this happening, but it's been going on a long time and it's just only getting worse. So yeah, it's an interesting thing that yeah. they're trying. Yeah. All right. Well, interesting story, and uh, we will have some links for that story in the show notes. Uh, Before we get to Joe's story, let's take a quick break here to hear a message from our sponsor. We were talking about mitigating cyber threats to your organization before your users even see them. The new Fish ER Plus from Nobefore was developed to help you supercharge your organization's email security defenses. How? You get a unique crowdsourcing advantage. More than 10 million highly trained Nobefore end users from across the globe catch and report malicious email that makes it through all the filters. Nobefore's Threat Lab then validates it with AI and with human researchers. Fish ER Plus blocks phishing threads other tools have missed and proactively removes them from your users' inboxes. Not quite time travel, but we think you'll agree it's a vital capability in any InfoSec professional's arsenal. Visit knowbefore.com slash products slash fish ER dash plus to learn more. That's knowbefore.com slash products slash fish ER dash plus. And we thank Nobefore for sponsoring our show. All right, we are back. And uh, Joe, what do you got for us this Dave, week? Dave, last week from, actually from, uh, we got so much over the course of the last week, so much email yeah. that I decided I was going to uh, share some listener stories this week. Okay. The first one comes from Jax, who says that over the 2023 holidays, he received a text message from Chase Bank that said, uh, this is a fraud alert. Did you approve this purchase? And he's like, I don't have a, a, an account with Chase. Hmm. This is obviously a scam. Hmm. But, he, but he doesn't do anything, right? But then it gets the best of him. He gets a little bit worried about it and he types... No, and replies to the uh, replies to the replies to the text with a no, hmm. uh, thinking either I'll start to see a scam here or something else will happen. But what happens is he gets a message back that says you've already responded to this alert, hmm. which is weird. So he actually uh, gets on the phone and tries to call Chase because that that doesn't satisfy him. So he calls Chase and he says um, that he has to go through their their uh, automated phone screening ringer, right? which uh, is just a miserable experience. And there is no option for, I don't have an account, but I still want to talk about fraud. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. right. So, that doesn't fit in the phone tree. Yeah. He, he eventually penetrates the bureaucracy and he gets through to somebody and they are ultimately able to confirm to him that yes, that message did come from them, but there wasn't any more information they could give him. 
he had to go to a Chase branch, hmm. which the closest one to him is an hour away. Ugh. Oh my so God. He's not going to go to a Chase branch, right? So the uh, ne- the next thing that happens is he said he got another one in recently, like within in the month of February. And now he's wondering, should I have gone to the Chase branch? Here's what I think is happening. Hmm. Somebody has erroneously entered a phone number into their text alerts. Or maybe, Jax, you, have you recently acquired that phone number and that's somebody's old phone number? And it's still getting the text alerts from somebody, the fraud alerts from Chase for somebody else's account? Because these are coming from Chase. Yeah. So that that's my best guess. But if someone had already responded they're, they're, to it, it... It goes to two two phones. The right. text gets sent to two phones. Oh, I see what you're saying. So you could you could have your account set to send all messages to two different phone numbers. Right. And so the person who's on the other phone number has already responded. I could see that happening. It would just, just being a wrong number. Yeah, essentially it's a wrong number. Or maybe somebody has entered something wrong. It, you yeah. Know, they, they've misentered their spouse's phone number or something. Yeah, it mm-hmm. could happen. Because um, yeah. I don't, I had to make a conscious effort to remember my wife's actual phone number <laughs> instead of just going to my favorites and pushing on her face on the phone, right? <laughs> That's... God, they say romance is dead. Right? <laughs> pushing on her face. <laughs> I have pictures for all the content. Uh, honey, I can't wait to bring up your picture every time I call you. Push, push on, on your, your face. face. That's all I push on your face. A modified and I know version soon, of that Monty Python song. Then. Soon, right. your, yeah, <laughs> soon your dulcet tones will be in my ear. <laughs> oh, you have just brought back uh, childhood. Memories. Moving on <laughs> to yeah, so, your next my, story. Well, I wanted to say, Jax, if there's a thing that says reply stop to stop, these messages, I would try that. I don't know if there is for these kind of things. But Rodney has a twofer. Rodney actually got a phone call when he was at work, and it was his mom calling from his aunt's number. Okay. And he says, um, he says, I'm kind of in the middle of a call right now. Is this urgent? She goes, yes. And she proceeds to say that her dad, his dad, had clicked on a, a an ad, uh, you know, a pop-up alert about Microsoft warning for viruses. And uh, of course, they then <sighs> got access to his computer and showed him that showed them, as in quotes, all the traffics to these porn sites and money laundering, and they were going to try to help them. Uh, they said, they tried to isolate them, said they can't use any devices, not even their landline for 10 hours, which is why mom went out and got the uh, got the aunt's phone number. Uh, they, apparently, the aunt lives next door. Okay. So it was really convenient. Um, so he said, yes, that is a that is a fraud. And he um, he actually got them to get in touch with the bank. The bank said, you got to come in here. Um, and they uh, they put fraud alerts on all three credit bureaus, uh, and they closed their accounts and opened new accounts. Um, good job on the bank's part there. Yeah. Um, he did let he did let them know the scammers are playing a uh, playing for, pulling from a playbook here is what he says, hmm. and they create this crisis that they manufacture the panic, and then they they uh, come in with the solution. Hmm. So good work for Rodney and good work for Rodney's mom. Realizing something's up and calling the um, calling Rodney, yeah. who is uh, a help desk technician. Yeah, absolutely. this happened to my dad once. Uh, yeah, the Microsoft. I think I talked about it here. Yeah, the Microsoft message popped up on his Mac. <laughs> well, <laughs> I mean, it's <laughs> technically possible if you're running Microsoft on your Mac, but if it looks right. like Windows XP on your Mac, it's a little. Yeah, that's <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> That, it has happened to my parents too. I've I've received screenshots put in a Microsoft Word document and then forwarded to me in my email saying, "Is this legit?" There you go. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh. The second story uh, Rodney had is actually uh, two uh, two really sad stories, and he talks about uh, these women that he knows. And they are tangentially, uh, you know, friends of friends that have been scammed uh, in romance scams, and one of them, it turns out, had actually only realized it was a scam after she had on her own traveled to South Africa and then traveled to Canada to meet this guy. Um, uh, Presumably, I'm thinking that this was to meet him when he wasn't expecting her, but she walked into where she was expecting to meet somebody and the receptionist there said, yes, this happens frequently. This is a scam. Yep. Um, So, but the other one is somebody who is ongoing right now is is still getting scammed out of uh, out of money on a regular basis, uh, and she is now targeted by four different people, which he suspects, which Rodney suspects, may be the same guy, but it may be four different guys in the same gang. 
Mm. Um, and no matter what they tell this woman, she doesn't believe that this is yeah. a scam. Yeah. Yep. Um, and it is it is really tough. And Rodney wanted to wanted to point this out. This is again part of the psychological conditioning for this. And I. Don't know that I can easily relate to this one, but I, there's no way I'm going to sit here and, and say that this woman should know better. She 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 doesn't. She's being victimized by uh, at least one person, and they're they're just taking her money from her. Uh, I don't know what the solution is here for this. When you have somebody that you know is is being victimized this way, and Rodney points out this woman is not some average person off the street. She is a, a CPA and a former CFO for a company, mm-hmm. and she's getting scammed out of money by romance scammers. Oh. Hmm. Yeah, when you want to believe it's true, you can't convince somebody that it's not true. I mean, that's—I right. have personal experience with this one. Very, very close family and friends I know have fallen for this. And um, I should also mention, I know someone who worked at the Nigerian consulate for years. And, uh, sorry, the American consulate in Nigeria. <laughs> Let me clarify. Right. And literally their job was, a lot of it, helping Americans who had traveled to Nigeria only to realize the person they were there for was non-existent. And right. no matter how many wow. times that intervention happened, people still, even if they were there in Nigeria and lost a lot of money, people still believed that that person was, that they were waiting for was real. So it's huh. a very difficult problem. Um, and I, I have, as I said, I know people who have fallen for the scam as well. And I've been part of interventions trying to help this person. I've tried to, um, you know, lean on any of my expertise that I have to say, hey, this is definitely right. not a real thing. If people are convinced it's real, there's, in my experience, I, I I don't have any happy tale to say here. It's nothing I have ever said has worked. Uh, I well, wish I could say it I, has. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask about. Like, what is a high enough authority for someone that they would that you could, um, you know, put put some sense into them? Uh, could you, if, if I'm thinking, like, do you bring in a police officer? Could you bring in an FBI agent? Could you get their priest or their rabbi or like who? So can I tell you what we tried? And then this, we brought in the person who I know who uh, fell for this scam. We brought in that person's children. We brought in that person's priest. We brought in that person's siblings. uh, And we brought in that many people in the, the sort of the broader family network of which I am a part. Um, We brought in pretty much everyone we could think of, including, uh, the person I know who worked at the consulate in Nigeria. And, and literally none of that worked. And the priest was the person we were hoping would be most effective uh, as that is a very esteemed person in this person's life. And none right. of it worked. It, like none of it worked. I, I honestly, even, even the bank stopped her and said, you're being scammed, ma'am. And it just didn't matter. So I have to say this scam is the one that really terrifies me because it, it, I, have, I don't know of many success stories where people have been able to get through to someone and say, hey, this is, you're, you're being scammed. I know it really hurts. But, uh, you know, this is not real. It's just, it's a really tough one. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess, you know, as Joe and I have talked about time and time again, is is if you can try to get to them before it happens and inoculate them, yeah, then you have a better chance of it not happening. But I think to your point, Maria, once they're down that path, it is so hard to bring them back. They are fully vested. They sure are. I, it, yeah. It, yeah. it was really eye-opening to be part of um, an intervention for su- such a situation. This was many years ago. Uh, yeah. And I just couldn't believe it because as I, I, we actually tried inoculating this person previously because uh, uh, it was it was a concern that many of us had had that, that this person would be potentially a victim. Um, mm. And it just did yeah. not seem to help. Is this person still being victimized? No, they are not. They're, they're okay. okay now. But, uh, okay, I, good. I, I I think basically the scammer lost interest. I think the the process got uh, we managed to extend things enough that the scammer just kind of left this person alone. But uh, it, uh, it was a very it was many dicey months of just trying to figure out how to keep this person from causing harm to herself uh, financially, <laughs> and, right. and and heartbreak was inevitable. But it was it was really tough, uh, and every time I read about these, I, I go, I, I remember how hard that was. And you're right; it, it can be a very well educated person who intellectually knows that this is a scam, but emotionally, it's a different story. And then, correct that disconnect. Mm-hmm. That's a very is hard. important distinction. Yeah, 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 it's very difficult. All right, well, Joe, you got one more here. Right? I, I do. Uh, we can go into it if we have time. Uh, this is from uh, I don't, uh, Zero X Cyan God. 
Okay. One of those really cool hacker names. Not their real name. Not their real name, <laughs> yeah, no. Just not on the birth certificate that way. <laughs> but but uh, he says that wallet drainers like Inferno Drainer and uh, others are constantly using phishing sites to steal millions. And he has an example of a phishing site that was uh, designed to trick users into a wallet draining app by faking a legitimate wallet security extension. Hmm. So this is a, a, um, a wallet security plugin called Wallet Guard, and it looks like a Twitter, um, a Twitter uh, tweet, a tweet, or an X, or whatever it's called yeah, now. Right. Who knows? It says, luckily, I'm on time. Thanks, Wallet Guard, for saving my tokens. But in the bottom, there's a link to what is actually a just something that drains your wallets. Hmm. Just goes in, gets your private keys, sends the private keys out, then I guess the person who, uh, who receives the information drains the wallets. So you sign up for wow. something to protect your wallet and instead... Yeah. I don't even know if you sign up for it. I think you just download it. And right. Yeah, that's all that happens. But I would imagine part of the process here is giving it access to yeah. your wallets, yep. which makes perfect sense if you're trying to protect your wallets. Right. I don't know, I don't know how much of a uh, use case I would have for Wallet Guard itself. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know. There's a better security practice called Cold Wallets. Uh, where you keep things off of computers, yeah, you know, and uh, you know you get a hardware wallet and you put if you if you're the kind of person that has a lot of cryptocurrency, you don't keep that all in one software wallet. Yeah, no, I mean it seems like this is clearly targeting the unsophisticated, yeah, uh, cryptocurrency investor, right? Well, <laughs> yeah. which I'll bet there are a lot of those. Didn't want to say. All right. (laughs) (laughs) Pregnant pause. (laughs) All right. Well, good stories. uh, And uh, but now it is time to move on to our catch of the day. Dave, our catch of the day comes from Zach, who writes, Hey guys, great show. Got this in the mail today. My wife actually purchased this item and initiated a return through Amazon. Uh, I saw it on the counter and asked if she had done anything with it, and if she had not responded to it. Uh, she, He says he finds this hilarious, a real phishing message he can hold in his hands. Now, Dave, I'm going to describe the picture here. It is uh, looks like it comes on Amazon letterhead. Right. Uh, there are a couple of... Uh, uh, pictures of a model or two models wearing tights. Yep. I guess in the U.S. we might call these pantyhose. Yeah. But these are. Uh, it's a. Uh, it's what's interesting to me right right off the bat is that uh, his wife has already returned these these uh, tights. Yeah. So I'm wondering where. Well, let me read it and then we'll we'll get to our questions. Yes. So it, it reads like this. It says, "Dear valued customer, thank you for purchasing our fleece lined tights on Amazon." We hope the product is working well for you. Congratulations! You are chosen as the lucky customer to have a $15 PayPal payment by sharing your shopping experience. Get your PayPal payment now. Write a review and take a screenshot. Email us the review screenshot. A PayPal payment will be sent to you within 48 hours after your review is live online. Any concerns about the product? Please feel free to contact us via mail. We will get back to you in 24 hours during working days, and satisfying solution is promised. Mm. Attention, for your account security, please don't attach pictures of this letter when you leave a product review. Mm -hmm. Hope you enjoy our products. Thank you for being one of our valued customers and for your great trust. Looking forward to hearing from you soon. Yours sincerely, Customer After Sales Team. And it says here there's an Outlook address. So here's what I think is going on here. This is just a, this is actually from the seller yeah. on the Amazon site, and they are just trying to buy a five-star review. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. So, Zach, if you really want to mess with them, you can just send this directly to Amazon, which is why he says here, for your, your account security, don't attach this letter to your reviews. Right. Because then Amazon will go, ho, 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 hold on. You can't do that. That's against our terms and conditions. Yeah. Have you ever gotten one of these? I have never gotten one of these. No. I have. I've have gotten you? tons of these. Yeah. Tons. They wow. come with almost Tons. everything I get now. It's amazing. Is that right? Uh, yeah. I mean, I don't, I try not to shop on Amazon as, as much as I can. I try to avoid it. But when I do, it, there's often something like this in there saying, don't tell them we asked you to leave a five star review. We'll incentivize right. it in some way. Um, it's so common now. Uh, it's, yeah. <laughs> I got one, I bought a box of collar stays. Um, okay. Like 500 collar stays. And they <laughs> that said, That's a lot of collar stays. <laughs> you guys, oh yeah. God. You know what? I'm already out of, of shirts. Of 
You lose Jeez, them I'm, every time. I you do. I do. Yeah, I, I already have. I'm, I was like looking at my box this morning. I'm taking the long ones and breaking them off and thinking to myself, I got to buy more collar studs. <laughs> okay. Wow. But but I uh, I got an email that said, Hey, would you mind give us in the give us giving us a review on your collar stays? I mean, there wasn't a promise of anything else, right? It's just <laughs> asking you for the review. review a collar stay? Right. So I wrote the most sarcastic <laughs> review. It's a piece Five of stars, plastic you put again. in your collar. Yeah. <laughs> right. These collar stays are great. <laughs> I mean, I've I've fallen down the, the trap of using substandard collar stays, and let me tell you. You're, a man walks with confidence when he has the right collar stay. You laugh, Dave, but I actually there do have a, a story about using the wrong collar stays. Oh, oh my, my gosh. gosh. <laughs> but you'll see in some stores, high-end stores, they'll say they'll sell metal, metal collar stays. Oh. Never, ever buy those. That seems very it's dangerous. Essentially, <laughs> it's essentially like jamming a knife into your shirt. Oh, okay. Also, Before I long, also imagine is you have a hard time getting through airport security. Yeah. <laughs> That too. Yeah. <laughs> that was a concern one time. <laughs> so yeah, don't buy the metal ones. Just get the cheap 500 plastic count. <laughs> or <laughs> or wear a button-down collar like Dave's wearing right now. But Dave, I want you to look here, right here, right here. Or to heck right with there. the collar stays. Oh, look at that. Look at that. I had that to break it off at the stay. end. Is, now, I, now I got to... Now that's one sharp-looking collar there, Jay. <laughs> I got to say. You're... On the other side, because I pulled this one out. Man. <laughs> Every girl's crazy about a sharp-dressed man. That's and there right. you are, Joe, with your, your <laughs> collar stays. <laughs> oh, boy, you can take that collar stay out and you can use it to press against your wife's face on your phone. And <laughs> she'll be then irresistible. It then it won't call. <laughs> right. Well, what are you going to do? You know, you, nothing's perfect. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, thank you uh, for from Zach for sending this in. We do appreciate this. It's a good one. And, of course, uh, we would love to hear from you. If there's something you'd like us to consider for the show, you can email us. It's hackinghumans at n2k.com. We want to thank all of you for listening, and of course, we want to thank our sponsors at Know Before. They are experts in helping users do the right thing through new school security awareness training. That is our show. We want to thank all of you for listening. Our thanks to the Johns Hopkins University Information Security Institute for their participation. You can learn more at isi.jhu.edu. A quick reminder that N2K Strategic Workforce Intelligence optimizes the value of your biggest investment, your people. We make you smarter about your team while making your team smarter. Learn more at n2k.com. Our executive producer is Jennifer Iben. This show is edited by Trey Hester. Our executive editor is Peter Kilpie. I'm Dave Bittner. I'm Joe Kerrigan. And I'm Maria Varmazes. Thanks for listening. <laughs> <laughs>